Hi everyone. Thank you for coming to watch my talk today. My name is Samuel, but you can call me Sam. And my goal is to have you all hopefully leave with a new appreciation and understanding for interspecific interactions that go unnoticed. I will be discussing my project, Hyperparasitism of Four Species of Avian Ectoparasitic Hippoboscid Flies by mites on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. I've been working on this for the past couple of years, and I'm now a graduating student at Vancouver Island University from the bio and math departments, but today is all about ecology. More specifically, we're going to be diving into a bit of ornithology, entomology, and parasitology. So here's our plan of attack for the next 10-ish minutes. I wanna give you all a bit of a background on the project, introduce you to some of the star organisms of this show, give a brief overview of the methods of this project, and take a look at the results before wrapping up. So a little background to set the scene. A few years ago, a similar study was published from the University of Lethbridge. This was a two year study in August of 2013 and 2014. And what they were looking at was the prevalence and density of hip bosked flies, also known as flat flies, on birds in Alberta. They caught birds, removed their fly parasites and brought back the flies for identification. What they were looking for was the presence of hyperparasitic mites attached to these flies. This was the first study of its kind. I wanted to do something similar on Vancouver Island. My main goal was to categorize the species of flies and mites found and also add to the knowledge database on this topic. So what is hyperparasitism? Simply put, a hyperparasite is a parasite whose host is themselves a parasite. So the system I have drawn here is a hyperparasitic mite that latches on to the flat fly host, who is in turn a parasite of the bird species, in this case, an Oregon junco. In the literature, flat flies in general are fairly understudied, and a lot of the literature I was using to identify these insects were from quite a while ago and in need of some serious updating. For one of the bird associated fly genera I was working with, the literature was very unclear on distribution and associated hosts because the two species in that genus that we can find in Canada, both have been historically identified as a single species or even misidentified as a similar species that occurs only in Europe. So as a poor as the literature is on the flat flies, there's even less out there classifying the parasites that these flies carry. So you may be wondering at, what, at this point, what exactly a flat fly is or what it looks like if you haven't had the absolute pleasure of, of encountering them before. So this here is one of my specimen, Ornithoica vicina, with some larval mites on its back. These, are fl these flies are from the family Hippoboscidae and they are characteristically very flat. <laughs> if you've ever come across them yourself and tried to squish them between two of your fingers, you'll find that it's almost impossible. They really are interesting parasites and are associated with a number of mammal and bird hosts. And they have the coolest life cycle. So hippoboscids are viviparous with egg and larva development occurring in the female uterus and feeding from the secretions of the milk glands. Because only one ovum and consequently one larva is produced at a time, a single female hippoboscid fly produces only seven or eight mature larvae in their lifetime. Let's just think about that for a second. Insects are one of the one of our favorite models for exponential reproduction. What with females that lay over a hundred eggs, but flat flies just have eight young in their entire lifetime. Once the mature hippoboscid larvae are released from the female, they pupate in the surrounding environment. Pupa are believed to be the overwintering stage of the flat flies life cycle, so they only have one generation every year. The last thing I want to mention about these flies is their range. In the near Arctic region where we are, there are 31 known species. Where we are is like Canada, United States. But worldwide, there is about 150 species. And this is because the family is most richly represented in the neotropics. <clears throat> and because the apparent northern limit to these flat flies is the 50th parallel. But this range itself is in question because personally I have encountered these flies farther north than the 50th parallel. 
So our next culprit in the study are the mites. This top photo shows mites attached to one of the flies I looked at under the microscope. The larger bulge there is the female mite, but the smaller casings around it are its eggs. The bottom photo shows a, a scanning electron microscope image of one of these gravid female mites. So why does this have any importance? Skin mites, or epidermophtid mites, burrow into the epidermis of their avian hosts, sometimes causing dermatitis and mange, which can lead to mortality. Feather-dwelling mites can chew away at the feathers rather than the skin of their hosts and can greatly damage the feathers, ultimately leading to decreased survival. But there's also current research looking at feather mites having a mutualistic relationship with birds, where the mites feed on bacteria and fungi of the feathers rather than the keratin itself. But it's for our case here, what we're most interested in is the epidermoptid mites because those are the ones that the hippoboscid flies carry. So typically, mites stay on their bird host for their entire life cycle, but the gravid skin mites can attach themselves to the flies to lay their eggs. Attaching to a, a hippoboscid fly is not only a good site to lay your eggs, but it's also a great food source. And on top of that, it's a really good way for them to easily move from bird to bird, facilitating mite dispersal between avian hosts. So because they parasitize a parasite, these mites are themselves hyperparasites. And once the eggs hatch on the fly, then the mites will leave the fly to colonize the bird host and wreak havoc there. So this is why the mites are so interesting, and it's why it's really neat to be studying them. <clears throat> so at this point, I'll get into the specifics of our methods. For this project, I aim to collect flat flies off of birds during the fall migration period of 2018 and 2019. And when I say I collected them, what I actually mean is all of the wonderful volunteers at the VIU bird banding station and also at the Rocky Point Bird Observatory. So all the flies were collected from wild birds during those banding operations. So once all the flies had been collected and everything in the fall, I was able to start identifying flies and analyzing the specimen. You may be wondering, how does one go about identifying flies down to a species? I can tell you that it isn't easy, but luckily for me, with hippoboscid flies, it's actually fairly straightforward. The key diagnostic characteristics to determine a fly's genus were one, the shape of the tarsal claws, two, looking at whether or not the hind margin of the wing was ciliated, and three, seeing if those two specific bristles that came off the top of the head came out of like a nipple-like turbicle or a straight edge. So to get ourselves down to a species, it became a little trickier. And basically for the species that had the same genus, it came down to figuring out how many hairless stripes were on one specific location of the wing um, between the two species. So obviously this needed to be done under a microscope. This figure I pulled out of my report to show the subtle differences. So do you remember at the beginning of this presentation how I mentioned that there were two species in a genus that were thought to be the same species? Well, this is, the, this is these guys here. So we have the genus is Ornithomaya and we have two species, A and B, Ancanuria and Bacardi. So this diagram shows the way that we differentiated them. And that was on Ancanuria, there was three glabrous bands, three or four glabrous bands in the median cell, which is just this cell here. And in the Bacardi species, there was at most two glabrous bands. So what does glabrous mean? Uh, it's a great word to add to your vocabulary. It means hairless. So in total, I collected about 160 flies. All of these came from birds either at VIU or in Victoria at the Rocky Point Bird Observatory. The flies came from 29 different bird species, including non-passerines like owls and woodpeckers, as well as passerines ranging in hosts from flycatchers all the way to warblers. The one individual bird that we collected the most flies from was at Rocky Point, a chestnut-backed chickadee with 11 flies on it, and all 11 flies were carrying mites. I managed to identify four species of flies, three of which I keyed out to a species, and the last one I was only able to get to a genus. As for the mites, 
they were present on 34% of the flies collected, which is comparable to the prevalence of mites on the birds or on the flies that were on the birds in the Alberta study. So there is still a lot to learn about them and we still haven't determined what species of mites we actually collected. So this table shows the distribution of flies, mites, and bird species. You'll notice that I've included six species of flies here. The bottom two, Lepoptena depressa and Neolepoptena ferici, are both mammal exclusive parasites. So it was likely that the collection of these flies were accidental occurrences on birds. But the other four species are bird specific parasites. So shown here is the fly that I was unable to identify to a species and only up to the genus Icosta. All the individuals of this genus were collected from northern sawwood owls, and I would be very interested to further study these parasites, but as hard as it is to catch the flies in the day, it's even harder to do that in the night. So this brings us to the end of my talk. We've identified at least four species of flat flies that parasitize birds on Vancouver Island. So that's the first time anyone's ever looked at it. And we know that the mites occur at a similar prevalence to the study in Alberta. There's also very little known, not only about the flies and the mites, but also how all of these things interact. And before I get, let you guys go, I just wanna send a thank you to my advisor, Dr. Tim Goder, to Dr. Heather Proctor and Hannah Stormer at the University of Alberta who helped with the mite side of things. And I'd also like to thank everyone else for all their contributions to the literature, to their volunteerism, and also I'd like to thank you guys for listening today. Have a great day.